Hosting provided by Host Tornado. They offer website hosting packages, dedicated servers, and VPS solutions. HostT.net. Programming Throwdown, episode 39, Rust. Take it away, Patrick. Email. It's such an integral portion of our lives. It but is. But what is it? Where does it come from? <laughs> Where does it? What does it taste like? What does uh, it taste like? So it's uh, delicious. Jason and I were talking about how email has become increasingly a portion of our business lives. Well, I guess personal lives as well. But that a large portion of our day is spent using email. And we were talking about uh, our experiences with Google's new inbox and trying to change how email is done and uh, sharing our opinions about email. Um, for me, I find that I have a horrible organizational scheme for email and I have tried all sorts of like inbox zero, whatever approaches. And it turns out I just end up using my email as some sort of weird to do. And like, I, I like seeing things, whether they're unread, read, out, in, labeled, like all of these are various levels of to do for me. Um, See, I, but I, inbox I have has like, been nice. a, I like it. I like that I'm I can zero inbox kind of person. I don't know. Are you that way? Like I can't, if I have an unread email, it just no. like makes me tick a little bit. No, <laughs> no. I have lots of unread emails. In fact, my lead came by one day and saw my inbox and was like, "You have how many unread emails?" So we're we talking like hundreds I was like, no, no, of it's thousands. Okay. It's okay. Yeah, oh, yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. No, not hundreds of thousands. No, no, like hundreds. Oh, hundreds. Okay. I'm not that bad anymore. Yeah, like I have it a little bit better now. Basically, if it gets past a month, I just auto, I just archive it all. Like, oh, away. nice. Um, but but yeah, I use it as like a to do. Like I read a message and then I mark it back as unread if it's like oh, I need to take action. Yeah, on this. right. Uh, and yeah, I know it doesn't work. And now, now inbox, the, the Google one, I use it for my personal and I really like it. And I don't quite get to inbox zero. Like I still st- leave stuff in my inbox. Um, although I have gotten to inbox zero with it because you can sweep away like large portions of messages, which I like. Yeah, yeah. But I like the, whatever they call it, I call it the boomerang feature because that was the name of a startup trying to do the same thing where you like say, give me this email new again in a day or in 12 hours. Oh, or yeah, yeah, yeah. When I get to work. I love that feature. I actually should use that. I haven't used it, but I think it'd be really useful. I just haven't incorporated it into my flow. But I use a lot of the like filters so that like I have a bunch of different categories and most of the email gets routed correctly. And um, that way things like... I have filters as well, but I find that if it's filtered out of my inbox, that just means it does not yeah, get Yeah, pretty right. much. Yeah, it's true. Like, like Who am I kidding? People fuss at me like, you didn't see this email message? I'm like, no, I... It's in a busy stream. I don't check. Yeah, I have this one uh, mailing list at work, and they put uh, automated emails, like test results, but then it's also used for, like, real communication, and that's the oh, worst because basically that that's, just, worst. that's just a black hole for me. Like, people are like, hey, did you get my email? And I said, did you post it to this group? And they go, yeah. I'm like, nope. <laughs> that's not going to happen. And then they're always like, there's ways around it. Like, oh, well, this, the test emails always come from the same thing or always having a suffix at the end or something. And it's like, that, now my rules just have to get really complicated. Yeah, this is silly. Yeah. Um, but actually, so, you know, there was yeah, that time you know. where they were trying to do Google Wave as like a replacement for email. But that um, didn't really take off. I really like think email is one of the last few things that needs like a refresh. You know, I mean, we completely refreshed the way video works. Like with, you know, you go from your camcorder to YouTube. Uh, like so many things now are just so just completely fundamentally different than they were before. But email is basically the same thing. I mean, there's smart filters and there's some ways to manage it. But the medium itself hasn't really changed. I mean, in fact, just the way email uses those greater than signs to like tell you that it's a reply email like like none of that that whole hacky oh. protocol has stayed the same all these years well even th- the fact that most of the email has moved to conversations like threads mm-hmm. right kind of like more like forum posts or whatever it would almost be better if like when you sent an email instead you were just creating like a wiki entry somewhere yeah. and like you, this is kind of the wave thing a little like and everyone can kind of edit it but not just like an open form edit but just more like a you know, instant message thread, but it's indexed like an email, right? Like yep. somewhere, the problem is some people use email as documentation, like a true wiki or, uh, you know, online document or even emailing Word docs. Other people use it as ephemeral, like text messaging. Yep. 
So it needs to support both cases. And it has to be backwards compatible because you're not going to get everyone off email in a day, right? That's right. That's, I think, the big problem with Wave was that, you know, the, the first thing Wave should have done is, like, allow it. It should have taken your entire inbox and converted it to Wave, you know? Um, yeah. It's hard, though, because even, like, at work, we use Google Docs a mm-hmm. lot. And uh, we had a vendor we were working with, and we sent him a link to the Google Doc, which he could access just fine. But he's like, oh, I didn't like working in the Google Doc, so I copied all your Google Doc into a Microsoft Word Doc. So, like, let's use this to collaborate. And it was like, (laughs) what? This is, like, fine. You may not like Google Docs, but, like, emailing a version Word Doc around is the worst idea. Didn't Microsoft go to, like, a Google Docs editing? I thought Microsoft had a cloud-based thing now. But people, I, I don't, as far as I know, people still just like take a dot doc and email it, and then you're supposed to make edits or suggestions and oh, email God. it back. Oh, God. That's so bad. That's so bad. So, yeah. So there's another thing, actually, now that I think about it, is sending a file. Like, that still hasn't been solved. Like, why is that still so hard, you know? Like, if I have, I, the other day I had like a two gigabyte file. And I wanted, it was a bunch of pictures. I wanted to send it to my parents. And I realized it's just no, there's just no way for me to do this. I mean, like, you know, so that such that my parents could receive the file without being like wizards or anything, you know? Well, it, the problem is like, where do you store, like your parents want a version of that file or the option to keep the file. But so you can't just host it from you because they also want a copy. But two gigabytes is a lot for them not to agree to accept. Right. Yeah. And there's no like third party like Dropbox or someone could like host a file and you could email the Dropbox link, but then you trust that they copied it down before you remove it or whatever. Yeah, I mean, the best thing I've ever used for this, and by best, I mean like most idiot proof, was AOL Instant Messenger, where I could literally just drop a file into AIM and it would just get sent to that person and they would have it. But that was only if the person was there. Yeah, I mean, that's fine. Uh, oh, yeah. But uh, anyways. But for that, you can use Dropbox, right? Like, you can put it in Dropbox, send the link, and then when they download it, just delete it. Yeah, if I had two gigs free on my Dropbox. But uh, I don't have that. That's the what? problem. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. You mean you're not paying them money? Yeah, I know. I'm just, I'm t- I want to freeload, but I also want everything they have. Um, That's called buying. <laughs> yeah. So, so we have some user yeah, feedback. Yeah, we have some awesome user feedback. Thanks. This was collected from email and from the um, you know, G Plus and Facebook pages and community, or community and page, respectively. Um, but uh, Simon, or Simon, you, uh, he told us, uh, he gave us a pretty cool link. There's this tool called ISPC, and it lets you take C code and turn it into SIMD. Um, so I haven't tried it or anything, but... Uh, it looks cool. It's on GitHub, so I'm assuming it's open source. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it looks pretty awesome. Um, I wonder how it works. Let me see. Overview. <laughs> <laughs> so SIMD was, oh. for those of you not following along, was at last episode, episode 38. That's right. So yeah, apparently it's an extension to the compiler. So... Um, and it uses LLVM. So you compile a bunch of your code to LLVM, you compile this to LLVM, and then now everything's LLVM, so it just kind of uh. works. Um, cool. I'll have to check that out. It's pretty awesome. So, so not exactly SIMD, but we've talked about CUDA before, and I had someone tell me today, because we were talking actually about SIMD, and they brought up CUDA, that if you are a CUDA programmer, apparently you can make mad money. <laughs> really? That's what they told me. I don't know if that's true, but they said that the demand for... Uh, GPU programmers is so crazy and the supply is so bad that if you can do that, that you can make, as they said, mad money. Are you doing GPU right now? Oh, no. so you're, so there's the potential. I mean, we both, so, so just some background, Patrick and I did GPU programming uh, several years ago. So. Yeah. So that's what I was thinking is like, man, apparently I'm not yeah, doing Apparently it. there's mad money to be made. <laughs> so. But he also wasn't doing it, so oh. apparently the money must not be that You know, mad, that's like so. an investor who tells you, you know, buy this stock, buy this stock, but then, you know, they don't have any of it or they're shorting it or something. 
Um, uh, so cool. So Nicholas Baring. And oh, by the way, all these people's names were public. Uh, so, um, but if, if I am saying your name and you're super offended, let me know. Because uh, I won't do it anymore. But uh, so far, as far as I know, it's okay. <laughs> um, Nicholas Baring said, uh, I made a comment in an earlier episode um, about how it's better to throw exceptions. He found some article where they said, basically never throw exceptions. Um, you know, like the program should always survive. And if there's some crazy case, you know, you should handle it and maybe log an error or something, but don't like crash the program. Um, but I think it's interesting. I mean, it's obviously a different perspective. Um, I think a lot of it depends on the specific program. So, I mean, for example, if you're doing like a front end web server, then you don't want, you know, the person clicks the follow button and, you know, it just crashes. Um, so there's there's definitely things where, and I would maybe even go so far as to say the majority of things, um, you have to sort of fail gracefully. Um, it just so happens that most of the things I work on, you can kind of fail loudly. And if the whole binary dies, um, you know, nothing's like impacted immediately. Uh, but yeah, I think he did bring a valid point and the article is actually quite interesting. So, uh, so definitely check it out. It's a different perspective on it. It probably depends on the language too, right? So, yeah, that's true. Like some languages are, so you like know, even in, it, for instance, like in Java, right? Like in Java, you, a lot of the libraries and stuff you call will throw exceptions and then you're kind of forced to deal with it. So if you're already dealing with it, throwing your own, in my opinion, I'm going to get flack for it probably, but is that like throwing your own isn't that big a deal since the code's already having to be set up to handle it versus like in C++, that's not normally the default throwing exceptions. Right. So if you start doing it, who knows if other people who try to use your code will be set up to handle exceptions or not. Yeah, and it depends on the framework too. Like if you're doing, say, a website, you typically have like a thread pool and if one of the threads crashes, it just spins up another one. And so all that really happens is that specific web request kind of fails, but you move on. But if you're doing something else, like some kind of device app, device side programming or something, and throwing an exception that isn't caught means, you know, killing the entire binary and now nobody can do anything. Then then obviously you have to have to not throw any exceptions there. Um, finally you have a uh, Bence Magyar. Hopefully I got your name right, Bence Magyar. Um, he linked to this pretty cool Python library called Bokeh, and it's a visualization library uh, for the browser written in Python. So I definitely want to check this out. Like personally, I think this is, this would be pretty cool. Um, I see a lot of value in this. I've been doing a lot of Python lately and doing a lot of visualizations. So I'll definitely have to take a look at this and uh, you guys should too. <laughs> it looks pretty cool. That does look great. All, All right. right, time for the news. For the news. First article is mine. Uh, a Virgin uh, oh, I guess the University of Virginia. I don't know, but there's a link in the show notes, but there was a very good PDF that I found on how GPUs work. It looks like it was part of a magazine or something, um, but I didn't see it when I uh, skimmed it, what, magaz what magazine it must have been a part of. It says computer. Was, is there a magazine called Computer? I don't know about that uh, magazine. Yeah, I haven't um, heard about it. <laughs> anyways, but it's how GPU works, written by someone from the University of Virginia and someone from NVIDIA. And it does, talks a little bit about like we talk about. And so even representing three-dimensional space, you use four-dimensional matrices. Uh, and they give a little bit of explanation about why that is, about some of the things that having a GPU allows you to do that you know weren't really feasible before, about shaders, about general GPU, just kind of like a cursor overview. It looks like about five pages long. So not that long, but, but a good thing we talked about. We've talked about GPUs a number of times, and this is a good... Uh, overview of what it is and the context behind it hmm. yeah i'll have to check this out so. um actually you know the gpus uh i have a friend from nvidia who is telling me that they're doing a lot more machine learning gpu activity um so i think nvidia specifically is building a bunch of machine learning libraries and stuff like that for the gpu and making that available to everybody and so uh, that's pretty, it's pretty awesome. I mean, I think, um, you know, a lot of like processors are now coming with GPUs either on, on the die or, or uh, you know, a lot of devices have GPUs in them and stuff like that. So 
This is we might have to revive our GPU skills. So <laughs> skills with a <laughs> make Z. Make mad money. Yeah, that's right, to make mad money. Mad money is also with a Z. Oh. <laughs> so this article is pretty cool. It's Mix Panels Pitch Deck. Um actually it's funny, the, the article originally was open sourcing our pitch deck and they got blasted on Hacker News for o for using the term open source when it wasn't source code. I didn't realize this was a big deal, but it's currently like a big social faux pas, at least on Hacker News, to to use the term open source for something that isn't source. So anyway, so they changed it to here's our pitch deck or <laughs> something. But it's pretty cool. It literally is their pitch that they use to um, secure their like uh, uh, VC funding. They got something like 70 million or something in series Series B or Series C. And it's about how they did that. Uh, and I mean, so it's the deck, but it's also, if you read the Hacker News comments, um, they also, the, the mixed panel uh, founders are there answering questions and adding commentary. Um, and it's actually, is it a really good read. So, so definitely check it out. It's pretty cool. There's a lot of things I didn't know because I'm not a, um, like not really in that area. So like, for example, there's a term called KPI. That's key performance. Uh, I forgot what the I is. <laughs> no. Do you know what the I is? Uh, let no. me look it up. But uh, it's like KPI and it was about, oh, key performance indicator. And basically it's a fancy way of saying how they're going to measure success. Um, and they also had like, you know, their graph showing their growth and stuff like that. So I, th I thought the whole thing was pretty cool. Um, they talk about some of the things that we've talked about on the show, like have a vision and and the vision is really important. Have like a good mission statement, all that stuff. Um, but uh, it's cool to see like a living example. Oh, they have a whole thing in here for their competition. Yeah, cool. they had that little that uh, was like an X chart or T chart or however you say that. But it's yeah, their competition. They had to break it down into free, paid, and then I forgot what the other axis was. Yeah. I always find that funny when you talk to people who have an idea for something or like you ever watch like that Shark Tank yeah. show on the TV and then like people are like, oh, I have no competition. There is, it's like, well, maybe. Yeah, you're probably doing something wrong. <laughs> Seems really unlikely you have no competition. It's like Tesla, Tesla saying like, who else makes electric sports cars? Well, no one. We have no competition. It's like, well, your competition is every other kind of normal car. Yeah, I mean, the other thing too is like, you even if now I don't know that Tesla actually says it. That was just yeah, a right. hypothetical. Even if like you uh even if you literally have something completely brand new, your competition are the audience of people who can clone you over the next five years, right? I mean you always have somebody, you know, who can who can duplicate what you're doing given enough time and, and that's so yeah, you should always have competition. Um at any rate. The next article is Goodbye, Dr. Dobbs, who, fun fact, Dr. Dobbs is not a real person. <laughs> it's a it's an amalgamation of two people's names. I forgot what they were now. I guess I should have had it ready, but I looked it up earlier. Uh, um, so it's two people together founded the magazine, Dr. Dobbs, and I, uh, 38 years ago, apparently. And they have decided, the current uh, editor and staff or whatever, and the company that owned them have decided to stop publishing Dr. Dobbs. Um, so most people have probably at least come across Dr. Dobbs at one time or another. Mm -hmm. Um, they have a huge corpus of like programming related content. So they get a lot of search hits when you search various programming topics. Um, and, uh, I don't know that I've ever subscribed to the magazine in college. I think they had it around. So I think I've read Dr. Dobbs in print before. Oh, okay. Um, that's where they put it on a dead, p dead tree paper <laughs> and like, uh, um, I don't know that magazines are, are, are that common anymore. I guess they are. And uh, and so they're, they're finally stopping. And the guy was making a point. He's like, it's kind of, the, the person writing the article, it's kind of interesting because their website currently has a more page views than it ever has had before. And it's been growing for over the last three years. That's still, you know, a pretty significant clip. Um, but that, you know, how much they're making is going down because basically they relied on um, pay-per-view ad and the pay-per-view ad industry is just like drying up. Yeah, right. Because it turns out no one clicks on those ads. No one, like, it's not helping anybody by seeing them. People block them from their vision. And so they're, they're actually, their ability to make money has suffered. 
Yeah, I mean, it's like they didn't really keep up with the times, you know? I mean, they, uh, um, like, the website itself looks very dated, and uh, the content is up to date, but, uh, yeah, it just feels like their business hasn't hadn't really adapted. Um, I wonder how, like, uh, how do, like, TechCrunch and these other sites make money? That's through pay-per-view ads, right? Um, is it just so there's like display ads or whatever, but it also like click ads, maybe click, click ads. Oh, I see. Also, I don't think like when these people say they have a lot of views, I don't think the views approach something like, uh, you know, TechCrunch. TechCrunch probably has like an order or two of magnitude more page views. Yeah, right. That makes sense. So, I, I mean, I don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, I mean, and then also, I think people like TechCrunch and stuff. They now like they run conferences and stuff too, right? And like people pay to go there or be a vendor there. Yeah, that's what it is. Make money that's actually ways. the right answer. I mean, yeah, that they, uh, yeah, you're right. All of these people, even like Node.js and stuff, they have the Node.js conference, and it's like a thousand dollars to go. You know, um, yeah, these people didn't really k- jump on that bandwagon, among other things. But uh, yeah, so yeah. I mean, I still get like magazines but the magazines i get are typically much like lighter fare uh dr dodds is like i guess would it be considered like a trade journal i don't know like i've never really read sat down and read computer science magazine trade journal type stuff yeah right it's either more tactical where i go to like stack overflow like how do i solve this problem yeah yeah. or like someone's blog post which i guess would be similar to this yeah another part of it is they didn't really handle the social side correctly like you have to log in to comment and so like nobody's gonna do that Anyways, I won't sit there and bash Dr. Jobs. Dr. Jobs is a great site. It has a lot of good... I really hope that they, you know, keep it on the Internet Archive or something so that, you know, all their historical, you know, information. No, I think... So, I think he said the intention is to keep serving the web pages because they are enormously popular. Oh, okay. They just won't make new content. Um, gotcha. That's right. Okay. Um, cool. So, uh, yeah, this is pretty interesting. So, there's a bug... So, you know, you always see these articles like the Bash one. What was that called? Um, oh, the thing in I Bash. Forgot. I'll yeah, look it look up. up. Keep going. So, so there's, there's Bash. There's the Heartbleed, which everyone knows about, the bug in SSL. Shell Shock. Shell Shock. That's right. And usually, I don't know too much about the Bash one, but I know the Heartbleed one. It's something like ridiculously complicated with like somebody can like look at the response times and like, you know, fit a distribution to it and like do all this crazy math. And it's like something you'd see in CSI. But this 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 like exploit is very very simple. Basically, um, you know the way your Git repository works, you have a folder called .git, and in your .git folder you have all this, all these things. Among of which are is this folder called hooks, and in the .git slash hooks folder, you can do hooks. So for example, uh, every time you commit, um, you can you know save the date to a file or you can I have a friend who every time he did a git commit it took a picture using his uh, laptop camera and so he has a picture annotated with the commit so you can see like how how stressed he was and he was making the commit just goofy stuff but you could also do really productive things like uh, you know check the code make sure it's formatted and if it's not formatted like if it's not auto formatted then fail the commit etc so now if somebody in their Git repository has like a .git folder and then had a hooks folder and made their own hook, then that'd be pretty bad, right? Because what could happen is you would clone the repository and you would also end up inheriting all of these hooks that could, you know, basically execute arbitrary code on your machine. So Git tries to be smart about this and they say, look, in your Git repository, you can't have a .git folder. Because because you would be able to do this, right? But they didn't think about case insensitive. So if you have, for example, like a dot capital G I T folder, then it oh. says, Oh, that's fine. But on Windows, that's not fine. <laughs> and on Mac, it's not fine because the Mac has the HFS case insensitive by default. So yeah, all you have to do is make a dot capital G git folder and then make a hooks folder and then, you know, RMRF someone's hard drive. And anyone who clones your repository and does a commit will wipe out their own hard drive. Uh, and of course, you can do a lot worse than that, right? So, um, 
So, so did they actually find this happening or they just someone discovered this was a possibility and then they kind of stopped it? Um, that's a great question. You know, they're never going to tell you that, right? Um, they're never going to say like, you know, who, uh, like how they found this, right? Um, let me look. Yeah, yeah no. Well, sometimes you know because sometimes like you find like the way it's found is a circulating worm or something, right? And oh, like, I see. So I haven't I haven't heard anything about it. maybe this is how uh how those hackers got into Sony. <laughs> oh. Oh, yeah, that's another story, but yeah. um but uh but yeah, so basically if you have Git, um you should upgrade to 2.2.1 or at least you know until you do that, um just look at the repository you're cloning and just make sure it doesn't have a dot git folder. Uh, you know, if you're doing this... Well, GitHub is saying that they are blocking it. Like, they're not allowing it anymore. That's so. right, yes. And then they scanned all their repositories and fixed it. So it should be impossible to happen on GitHub. That's right. So on GitHub, you're fine. I'm assuming most of these sites are doing something similar. Um, so yeah, in general, it shouldn't be a big deal. Uh, if you upgrade to Git 2.2.1, you're guaranteed not to have this problem. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I thought that was kind of interesting. Time for tool of the show. Tool of the show. My tool is not out yet. I played it on the desktop. What? I know. I'm told this is the worst kind of cheating. Uh, but it, they said it would come out in 2014. So they have like, what, 12 days to pull this off. Um, but uh, it's on desktop. It's coming to Android and iOS this year. It's called This War of Mine. And basically, it's The Sims, but... Um, Think of it as like The Sims on hard mode. You know, like if you've ever played The Sims, it's very tame, right? Like you, the only thing that's really getting in your way is aging and you can turn that off. So, you know, you kind of go through, you you learn how to cook, you do things at your own pace. And, uh, but it's fun because you're constantly getting better and you grow a family and you, so you see the growth and the growth is addicting, you know, being a part of that. Um, the thing that kills me about The Sims is that it doesn't feel like a game to me. It feels like a simulation, kind of as the name says. And I really wanted The Sims-like experience, but with a game where like I could lose and there are enemies. And this is exactly that. So in this game, you, uh, you basically are playing The Sims, but in this war-torn Yugoslavia... And uh, it's very hard to survive. Even to just grow food is extremely difficult. And the goal is to survive for, uh, I won't spoil it, but for a certain number of days. And as things go on, you, just, you get more and more desperate because it's, it's very hard to become sustainable. Um, so I, I'm trying to look here. I don't actually understand. Is it a multiplayer game, a single player uh, it's, game? It's like The Sims, so it's single player. I mean, you're managing okay. multiple Sims, but, uh, but it's totally single player. Um, it's, it has another thing that's pretty cool. So in later versions of The Sims, they had this sort of uh, vacation mode where you'd go on a vacation somewhere and then it becomes almost like an adventure game. Um, this kind of took that idea. So at the end of every day, so after I think it's 12 hours of, of in-game time, uh, you can scavenge. And so you pick one of your Sims and you send them in, and now the game becomes kind of like a kind of like a point and click adventure in a sense but like you gather resources you trade with people so like during the day you can uh make moonshine and then at night you can sell the moonshine to soldiers for money and then uh and then use that money to buy bread and anyways there's a whole economy thing going on but it's really cool i had an incredible amount of fun playing it uh, I got kind of burnt out because I played, I was playing like all nighters playing it. It was kind of ridiculous. Uh, and then I beat the game and then I was like, okay, I got to take a break. But I actually want to play it again. I'll definitely be buying it on iOS when it comes out. So, yeah, check it out. All right. My title is also, well, I guess it's only iOS, but also mobile. And it's called Vain Glory. You may have seen this on advertisements on the actual television. They've been running ads for it. And it, I believe it was part of the WWDC presentation uh, where they talked about the new Metal API for doing graphics processing on iOS. Uh, and this is a massive online battle arena. Is that right? MOBA? Yep. Um, which is apparently the hot thing. I'd never played a MOBA before until I tried this one. 
and I did really miserable at this one for a while, and now I think I'm doing slightly less miserable. Um, but it looks really beautiful. Like, it's really amazing. Um, like, on, it doesn't feel like it's a mobile game. It feels like it could be a PC using a mouse and a keyboard. Like, it really feels good and high quality, and it doesn't feel weird or hard. Like, I've played other games where there were supposed to be, you know, sometimes PC ports or PC quality style games, and, like, the controls are very awkward and weird and just doesn't work out well, and I didn't ever feel like that with this one. Yeah, I've also been playing Vainglory, uh, yeah, I think it's great. It's a, it's it's. I actually, I always kind of wondered how the UI would work for a MOBA because you know there's times where you have to click across. So the you've map. played other MOBAs before, though, right? Yeah, yeah, I've played like desktop MOBAs, and you know one of the things like clicking on the other side of the map to go to a strategic location. The way they did that, where I mean I don't know how you do it, but the way I do it, I use my middle finger on the mini map to like pan it around. And then when I have the spot I want, I use my index finger to just tap anywhere on that screen. Yeah, something sort of like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the way they did that was very clever. Um, also, so in most MOBAs, um, the enemy's health, like the, the, the little grunts, their health doesn't turn colors when you can one-shot them. And that actually makes a huge difference because with, like, Dota... Oh, I didn't know this. Wait, wait. So when they're on their last hit from you is the only time it changes colors? So, yeah, like the enemies, the little grunts, they oh, have a regular health bar. But when you can, like when the game calculates you can last hit them, the bar turns like a bright red. Oh, I didn't know Yeah, this. and so that makes a gigantic difference because in Dota, um, you have to constantly like, you know, because you have a desktop with a big screen, the health bars are bigger. And you have to sort of look at the health bar, how many pixels wide it is, and make a judgment call on if you can do the last hit. And often you're wrong and it doesn't completely kill the enemy. And so as soon as you go to mobile, this becomes even more frustrating with the health bars being small, right? So they, they just they just said, look, we're not going to play this game. We're just going to tell you when it's a last hit. And I thought that was clever. Mm. Um, so yeah, basically they got a bunch of things right uh, with this game. So I think it's pretty awesome. And it's free to play? I think most MOBAs are now, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, totally free to play. You can... That's like the... the and so in this one, the only thing as far as I can tell that you spend money on is they have a rotation of characters and only a subset are available for free to play at any given time. So if you want to guarantee your favorite character is always available, you have to you know buy it with either in-game currency or currency that you converted... Normal dollars you converted to in-game currency or whatever. But right now they don't have any other way to spend your money, as far as I yeah, know. Yeah, that's I think that's right. So yeah, the um, defense of the ancients they give you all the characters, but uh, you can spend money on silly hats and stuff like that. Um, they actually they added some things recently which are pretty cool in defense of the ancients. Like you can spend money to um, to like make a bet on who will win the game, and based on the results of the bet, you get items, and so it's. It's basically the same thing, like you're you're getting silly hats, but because it's like they basically you pay for this gambling mini game that you play while you're playing Dota, kind of, like like you can bet against your own team <laughs> and stuff like that. So uh, so those things are actually wait that sounds awful because if you bet against your own team, you can just you can just make your team lose. Uh, that's true. Yeah, I actually never really thought about that, but uh, this is like why gambling is so controversial amongst people who are professional athletes. But I think the consequence of winning or losing the bet is low enough that it's like, I'm not going to spend an hour playing a game that I've thrown so that I could get, you know, one one hundredth of a silly hat. So anyways, um, they, they have a bunch of cool things like that. So I'm sure Vainglory will go in the same direction eventually. All right. All right. All right so on to Rust. On um yeah rust is rust is pretty cool i uh actually this was a user request i believe um somebody's i think multiple user requests yeah that's true multiple so uh i didn't even know about rust um and uh you know it hasn't it hasn't really made hacker news or at least i haven't seen it on hacker news uh actually i take it back you must not look at it very often yeah i was gonna say i'm sure it's made hacker news but i just happen to not catch it um but uh it's just it's the same as this new trend of languages to have the same name as common things. Go, Rust. Yeah. 
uh, I don't know of another good example, but it's this problem. Like you see it and it's not clear that it's this. Also, there was a video game called Rust or is a video game called yeah, Rust. That's so right. for a long time, I thought they were talking about the video game. Yeah, yeah. That, why do they do that? They should make it something very clear. X, Y, Z, Z, Y or something. No. <laughs> do not call it that. Do not name a language that. Um, do you know what that's from? Oh, no. X, Y, Z, Z, Y is the, is the code you have to put in adventure to open this door. And uh, there was some way to figure out it was that, but it was super hard. Anyways, um, so Rust. Okay, so Rust, it's, it's like C++. Uh, it tries to be close to the metal. It's meant for, you know, system software, um, you know, web servers, socket servers, um, those kind of things, you know, embedded. Can, it, it compiles straight to machine code, so it could be used for embedded. It uses LLVM, so... If you have like an LLVM to machine code compiler for your, you know, Raspberry, well, Raspberry Pi is a bad example, but for your crazy architecture, Motorola, your whatever, architecture, yeah. then uh, it can, it, it'll work. You don't have to, um, you don't need any, an Intel processor or anything like that. Um, it tries to be very memory safe. So what that means is you actually can't get a null pointer exception at runtime. So the way the language is designed, um, you know, if if it's possible for you to null pointer exception, the compiler will just not allow that code to be compiled, um, which is pretty cool because, uh, you know, most null pointer exceptions, it's not because someone is doing something absolutely crazy and there's a you know, chance of it happening. Most of it are just blind user error. And so if someone is doing that, uh, it's just it's just a bug that they need to fix. Very rarely do you have to do something really wacky with pointers. Um, but with that in mind, Rust does not allow unsafe pointers. So, you know, for example, if you have some FPGA that's running at a certain memory address, um, and you just know that that address, you know, is 0x12345678, um, you can't just say pointer is equal to that. Um, it won't let you do that. So um, all the pointers have to kind of come from references to objects, and wait. So how do you how do you do that then? I don't think you can do it. I mean, I'm assuming they'll add like an unsafe pointer, you know, some oh, way okay. to do that. But at the moment, you can't do it. Um, so uh, yeah. So same thing with like in place uh, new and things like that. Placement new, you can't really do that yet. Um, but in exchange, you get a bunch of cool stuff. You get type inferencing, you get, you know, complete memory safety, a um, bunch of cool features. One thing they have, um, a common problem is if you have multi-threading and you share a pointer to an object with another thread, then it's very difficult to, like, keep track of who owns this object. It's always kind of a nightmare. So mm -hmm. what uh, Rust does is it says the thread that created... So, so the way the Rust works is you create a box and a box is basically a wrapper around a pointer which says that I want this pointer to go to another thread, this data. Um, and you can share boxes with other threads, but at the end of the day, you have to own the memory. So if another thread tries to delete a box that it didn't create, um, the compiler you know, gets unhappy. Uh -huh. um, yeah, and, and so the... Uh, which thread created the box is actually encoded sort of in the box type. Um, so there's that. There's a, It has traits, which are similar to interfaces in Java, but uh, one difference is you can actually have function bodies in traits, but the functions, there can't be any data members. So in other words... You know, like in Java, if you have an interface, you can't have like int a as a member of the interface. It doesn't let you have data. And that's because of the the diamond problem, right? Like if you have two interfaces with an int a and you have a class that implements both of them, now it's it becomes like very a nightmare, right? It's ambiguous. So they don't let you do that. But you can have functions. The catch is the function body you know, basically your only parameters can be what gets passed into the function, which is cool. So, for example, if you have, you could have an interface called, like, square and have a function called area, 
but it would have to take the si the length of the square as a parameter. Um, but yeah, there might be cases where you need functions like that. Um, or you, so this know. is like, yeah. Yeah. That's the same thing as just a function pointer. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's basically a function pointer. So, um, so that's pretty cool. That was, I thought that was very clever. Um, it has two runtimes, which I thought was interesting. So it has native and green. Um, in native mode, Rust behaves just like C or C++. You know, if you create a new thread, um, you know, using P threads or Win threads or whatever in C++, then uh, it's it's a new thread, and so the OS keeps track of all the threads and all of that. Um, as you remember from our Go podcast, we talked all about coroutines, um, and Rust supports coroutines. So, if you use the green Rust runtime then you get support for coroutines, which is which is pretty cool. So, um, you know, there might be cases where you have very limited memory or you need real-time guarantees and things like that. You can use the native Rust runtime for that. And for everyone else, we can use the green uh, Rust runtime and now it behaves like Go. But you have to choose one per program? You have to choose. That's right. For binary. That's right. So yeah, it's actually I think a different compiler or something like that. Oh, yeah. okay. Um, yeah. So is the API similar enough that like you can move it back and forth or? Uh, actually, it's identical. So, um, oh, okay. so for both of them, there's so there's an idea in Rust called a task, which is basically like a, like a thread or you know they're all kind of the same thing. Um, so in Rust, you you create tasks. And uh, um, if you're using the um, native Rust runtime, a task becomes a thread. And if you use the green runtime, a task is a coroutine. But none of your code changes. So it's just the guarantees change. Like if um, you actually specify the size of the thread pool. So let's say, just keep things simple. Let's say you have a thread pool of size two. So you have, that means that you have you know one thread available for your main uh, thread, then there's one other thread. So if you spawn two tasks in Rust and you have a green runtime with a thread pool size of two, it can't execute both of those because it's already using one for the main thread and it only has one left. So it'll execute those two spawn spawned tasks serially. Um, so if you use the native um, version of the runtime, then every time you call spawn, you're going to get a new operating system thread and it's going to start. So it's a guarantee that if I call spawn, this code is going to start executing as fast as possible, right? Well, it's going to let your OS try to decide. Yeah, that's right. I mean, yeah, the guarantee is that is that you will be... It will do the best the language can. That's right, that's right. So, um, but with the coroutine, you know, if you, if you, uh, if you have a thread pool size of two and you execute, you know, 10,000 coroutines, they're all going to execute sequentially. Whereas if you have 10,000 threads, they're all going to execute in parallel. I mean, that might, so yeah, that might hurt you. Yeah. So in practice, you know, 10,000 threads, probably not a good idea, but, uh, um, but, but, you know, in theory, that's how the, the native one works. So I would imagine the native mode is only for people doing, like, very low-level embedded where they, where they really need that, you know? Yeah, that's interesting. I've not really heard of something that, like, out of the box wanted to support two runtimes. Other things do support multiple runtimes, but... Well, this actually I, came from yeah. Go. So I, So one of the common criticisms of Go is that you, know, you can't guarantee that a go routine is going to start even you know within minutes of when you create it um and so i guess that's a pain point for for some people so um yeah i i personally uh not a big fan i feel like if you need something to start you know within a minute then uh you, know, you probably uh you're probably doing something wrong <laughs> but you know who knows so yeah, I don't know sometimes these pain points if they're people actually ran across a legitimate problem or they're just imagining in theory this could become a problem. But in practice, you wouldn't actually hit it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I'm thinking in practice, either one of two things. Either you're doing like a web server where, you know, if you have a few seconds in between like when you spawn a task and when it 
executes, it's not that big a deal. Or you're doing some very low level embedded, in which case you don't have that many tasks. So they would just start right away anyways. Um, so yeah, if you're not, if you're doing embedded, you're not running any of these languages. Let's just be honest. Uh, that's true, but you could be. There's no reason why you could. Maybe I, it'd be nice. There's really no reason why you couldn't run Rust on you know, even a Motorola. I've not something. looked enough at its compiler, but yeah, well, it yes. goes through LLVM, which is what Clang goes through. They they make the claim that you know, their whole goal of the language is to be as fast as Clang or, or be as close to Clang's performance-wise as possible while still having you know these features, and they claim to be pretty close. So who knows? Okay. Um, so yeah, it was made by a motor, uh, Mozilla employee. So actually I wanted to talk about this for a little bit. So have you heard of M scripting? Yes. So M scripting, we've talked about it. I believe yes. in our JavaScript episode. Or yeah. Yeah. So M scripting was created by a Mozilla employee and this was, and basically I feel like Mozilla employees are just very creative people. <laughs> like it just seems like, or at least these two were, well, yeah, maybe. It just, I, I, I get the impression that like a lot of the cool stuff that's coming out now is coming out from Mozilla employees. But I could be wrong. I don't know. I, I guess for the size yeah. of the no, company, I, it just seems like they're creating a lot of cool stuff. But I mean, they're also, their wheelhouse is also very well aligned with what the internet would think is cool, right? So they're, you know, Mozilla is concentrated mostly on making browser and web related tools and products. I don't know if they do anything else, but um, like I don't even think they're doing server stuff or whatever, but maybe, maybe. Yeah. Um, and so, th but that's what people would find cool because if you're a web programmer, right, you're going to be very interested in something like Mscripten. Uh, Rust, I, you know, not so much. It doesn't seem as exactly in their wheelhouse, but. Yeah, that's um, a fair point. Yeah. I guess I can explain how it would be work-related and how what you're working on there would be of interest to a, like it's a very popular thing right now, right? Yeah, right. Um, so, yeah. yeah, it's still in... But that's a good point. There's a lot of good stuff seeming to come out of Mozilla. I can't dispute that. Yeah. Oh, the other thing is they created like an all JavaScript PDF renderer, which I thought was pretty cool. I don't know, it's just kind of goofy stuff. Nothing, nothing like groundbreaking, but just kind of cool. Like, this is what I would do if I had a bunch of free time. <laughs> um, anyways. Well, you should go work at Mozilla then. Apparently, yeah. Apparently, apparently Mozilla gives you a lot of freedom. Um, so I have a, it says your great standard library. So, uh, this is the batteries included thing. Yep. So a lot of tools out of the box that you get to do common operations. So you're not going to have to go write your own JSON encoder or decoder. Yeah. I mean, that's one there. thing about C plus plus that kills me. Like there's no easy way to go from C plus plus objects to disc and back without having to write a bunch of boilerplate. Like the best is the boost serialization library. And even that one's not that great. I mean, ultimately C++ doesn't have reflection. So, you know, it just, there's no way to do it, but this does. So, uh, actually this, this doesn't have reflection, but the language it's like the compiler itself has this auto serialization built in. That's how they get, that's how they pull it off. Um, so yeah, on the cons, we talked about this already, but you know, obviously going to be slower than C++. Um, they make the claim, you know, if you try to write all of these memory safety checks and stuff yourself in C++, that they would be faster. But that's not saying much because uh, that's not what people want to know. What people want to know is like, what kind of performance hit am I going to take? You know, um, the other con is too early. Yeah, that's always the problem, right? Is like. In C++, for right or wrong, you don't do that. But there are certain areas where you kind of say, like, I want to sac I get in trouble for this. I do a lot of low-level programming. And I get in trouble all the time. People are like, oh, this is not considered the safe way to do this in C. And it's like, well, this is some graphics routine that needs to run X number of times a second a lot and needs to run really, really, really fast. So, yes, you may think that it's not harmful to add, you know, not make this an inline function, like just make it a normal function. But it's like, I, I measured it and turns out on our platform that it's, you know, 10% faster to make this inline at the expense of a little bit of code size. Yep. Even though that's a violation of like the standard. It's like, but I measured it on our platform and in this circumstance, I need the speed over the, the you know, share. It's not premature optimization. Well, maybe it is, but I don't think it's no, premature. It's premature. You know, we got to the point it. we needed the speed and now <laughs> yeah. it's time to do it. And you can. 
Yeah. Versus like something like, you know, when you hear tools or whatever saying, oh, well, if, if you try to do all this in another language, you know, it wouldn't be as fast. It's like, well, but sometimes I don't want to do all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you use Rust, you're handcuffed to doing all that stuff, whether you want it or not. Um, but for 99 point some number of nines, you probably don't actually need to, you shouldn't be skipping those things anyways. Yeah. Um, my biggest con with Rust is that uh, it does have good third party library support and specifically it doesn't have any way to communicate with other like programs written in other languages. You know, like protocol buffers, Thrift, Avro, like even just having one of these would make a huge difference. So, so no good RPC support. Yeah, there's no RPC support. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there's, you know, basically, it's, you know, you have to write, if you wanted to write part of your application in Rust, you'd have to talk to it through JSON, you know, and you'd have to handle all the deserialization yourself and all that. And so, you know, I'm sure someone will make it. It's just not there yet. Um, and, you know, on top of that, it's, uh, it's still in alpha mode. And the developers encourage you to download, like, the latest bleeding edge build. They basically say don't download the stable build because it's missing so many features and we fix so many critical bugs that you're better off getting, you know, today's development branch than the stable release from three months ago. And that's, so that's a don't use sign. this for your work project, but for your hobby project, have exactly. It. I mean, it's basically where Go was when we talked about Go, <laughs> and now Go is much more mature. Um, so you know, I'm sure this will shape up just fine, but. Uh, in the meantime, it's a cool language to learn so that you're you're ready for when uh, when it you know becomes more uh, becomes more widely accepted. Wait, is that the equivalent of like uh, playing the stock market? Like, if you guess at what language you think will be big next, and you invest like a lot of time and effort into trying to learn it, so that when it becomes big, you'll be one of the first people to be ready for it. Is it like a speculative learning thing? Yeah, I mean, like in some way, we were like. We were speculators by learning the GPU. We just never cashed in on it. <sighs> yeah, we didn't get our mad monies. Story of my life. <laughs> but yeah. I remember when Tesla IPO'd and I was going to buy some. And oh, but now it's I like, had a friend who was telling me, like, buy Tesla, buy Tesla, buy Tesla, when it was like $40 a share. And uh, yeah, that guy's like rich now. He's like a multimillionaire. That hurts. You know, even like our yeah. first show was on Bitcoin. And if, if any of the people... No, Bitcoin has slid a lot now, though. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So I think it's down... I'd, I'd have to look at it. I, I, I want to say it was down like 50% this year. Um, and so that's always the problem, right? Like your, your friend who's a multimillionaire, if he cashed out all his Tesla right now, but most likely he'll hold on to it and then it'll go down and then like... Uh, and I shouldn't say most likely. All these people invested in Bitcoin and said, oh, I'm so rich. Like my Bitcoin's up tenfold, 10x, right? Like, and then, so it's still up 5x, but they'll all feel bad because they lost half of what it was worth. Yeah. So then they'll wait for it to go back up as it continues to slide down to zero or goes back up. I don't know what Bitcoin will do. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. It's true. That is true. Like uh, you, w whenever you reflect on these things, you always reflect on the high and uh, it's almost impossible to time that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, that. But all I was saying, language. Learn learn a language before it becomes a real. Yeah. Thing. If Rust was a stock, I would invest in Rust. The only thing it comes rather close to Go, to you know the Go language. Um, so it's unclear like why would you use Rust if you use Go? Uh, I, I mean, Rust does have the memory checking. I guess that is a big thing um, that Go doesn't have. But uh, um, yeah, I guess that would be the that would be the the number one reason to stick with Rust. But uh, but yeah, it's pretty cool. Check it out. Um, you can actually do some pretty fun stuff, like uh, get a pointer to a vector and then do pushback and then try to access that pointer. Rust gets unhappy. It says, hey, you did pushback <laughs> on the vector. You know, the vector called realloc. Now you're trying to access this pointer again. It's like, it feels cool to see the compiler like experience trying something that you would over the course of hours as you tried to debug. Like that whole process was kind of cool for me. So check it out, nice. you know, compile a few programs. It's pretty cool. And then, uh, uh, you know, wait a couple of years until it's, until it's awesome. So it looks like the high of Bitcoin was $950 and it's currently trading at $310. What was it when we made our first episode? That was like five years ago. 
Uh, hang on. The chart doesn't go back that far. Oh. In 2011, it was worth 40 cents. Yeah, there you go. So if you if you listen to our first episode and bought a thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin, you're like a millionaire now or something. <laughs> Wait, if you bought. Oh, I don't even know. Yeah, that'd be ridiculous. <laughs> Think of that. Like a thousand dollars is, you know, for most people, like what two paychecks or something, and uh, it's just like weird to think about that. But uh, again, there's no way to know um, that that would have happened. I'm trying to calculate in my head. The orders of magnitude is throwing me off. Uh, so okay, let's say it was a dollar and it went up to nine hundred dollars. That's two orders, two times. So if you spent a thousand dollars, you would have made a hundred thousand dollars. So yeah. So if you invested like yeah, yeah, thousand dollars, you'd been like a millionaire. Yeah, isn't that wild? Uh, and then if you had done it in like Dogecoin, you would you'd, you'd have like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's that's the other thing too is like your brain is trained to see the to see the outliers. It's not thinking about the millions of other like crazy things that came out that were not popular. It's a legitimate thing, right? Like they call, what is it? It's like survivor bias. So if you look at the S and P five hundred today, and say if I had bought all those stocks, you know, ten years ago, or whatever, and you say like how much money have I made, it's actually not fair because a bunch of stocks which used to be in the S and P five hundred ten years ago are now bankrupt and worth nothing. Uh, so like you would, it's like survivor bias. You can't take a stock that exists today because and trace it back ten years. Because you have to look at the number of stocks available 10 years ago. You know what I mean? Like when you pull from the distribution yeah, exactly. 10 years ago of stocks that were on the market 10 years ago, it's different than pulling from today stocks which also existed 10 years ago because that guarantees they are good companies that survived at least 10 years. Yep, that's right. You know, one thing that amazes me is Silicon Valley still, like many parts of Silicon Valley still haven't recovered from the dot-com boom. Like I was looking at specifically housing prices and there's many places like around San Jose, Morgan Hill, like all, all these places where housing prices are down like 20, 30 percent from their 1999 price. <laughs> like that just wow. blows my freaking mind. Um, but uh, yeah, the dot com yeah. boom was like a very popular boom, right? Like a lot of people were in on it. Yeah. I mean, you hear stories. I remember hearing stories. This We were... Well, I don't know about you, but I was in high school. You were probably in high school, right, at the time? No, I don't think I was even in high school. You were in high school, yeah. But the, uh, I mean, I was hearing stories about, like, you know, yeah, like, you get a, you know, you get a brand new car as a sign-on bonus and stuff like that. Just, like, ridiculous stories. Like a, like a, like a nice car. You get, like, a Lexus as a sign-on bonus. Yeah. But uh, those days are gone. And that was someone who just, like, sat and did Excel all day long. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They wrote a, they wrote a IP tracer in Visual Basic or whatever. <laughs> Did you yeah. see that CSI episode? No. There's a CSI no. episode that's kind of internet famous where this guy's like, uh, a hacker is hacking into our CSI database. We have to stop him. And this woman shows up and she goes, I'll write a IP tracer in Visual Basic. <laughs> and he's like, good, get on it. <laughs> so funny. Well, thank you to all our listeners and current viewers. Yeah. All the dozens of you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have a uh, number of people on the Twitch stream. My Twitch, for some reason, is flipping out. So I can't actually tell how many people are on the Twitch stream. But it's I feel like it's more than there was last time, which is pretty cool. Um, you know, so, definitely... So we're, we're the new Bitcoin, baby. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The... The... Uh, the... The... Uh, the, we're the Bitcoin of podcasts. <laughs> that's right. Uh, the... Um, the... The... Activity on Google Plus and on Facebook has been great. Lots of user questions. Um, this time we did something a little different where we just picked a few of the top user feedback and, and read it out. I feel like it went pretty well. It's a lot of interesting content. So thanks for that. Um, thanks for listening yep. and checking out your books and tools of the show and all of that. And uh, and there actually are way more than dozens of listeners, and we appreciate all of you. That's right. We have We have dozens of viewers, but thousands of listeners. And uh, big shout out to you guys for, uh, you know, it's because of you that we make this show. So uh, uh, right. that's what sort of keeps it fun for us. So I'll well, see you in the 2015. That's right. Have a happy new year. Happy holidays and all of that. And I will see you next year. The intro music is Axo by Binar Pilot.
Programming Throwdown is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 2.0 license. You're free to share, copy, distribute, transmit the work, to remix, and adapt the work, but you must provide uh, attribution uh, to uh, Patrick and I and uh, share alike in kind.